Hello everyone, and welcome to your 70th Cocoa Programming Tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about NS Collection View Diffable Data Sources. Now, this is a new introduction to Catalina, and this tutorial is specifically going to be targeting 10.15.1. So if you're going to follow along and try to make your own app at home, the deployment target has to specifically be set to 10.15.1. I'll come back around later uh, to explaining why that is, but just be aware that that is the case. So what are diffable data sources and how do they uh, connect to collection views? Well, diffable data sources or, or diffing is kind of a new addition in the foundation layer and I, I might even do a separate tutorial on that, but um, there are a bunch of new APIs for determining how you can diff between different uh, sets of arrays essentially. So the, the way this works is you essentially have an array that has uniquely identifiable elements. So let's just say you had an array A, B, C, D. And the way that the diffable data sources work is you basically have a data source that you start out with. And that in this case, they call it a data source snapshot. And then you apply a new snapshot of what the data source is going to become. So let's say I was going to remove element D from the array. I would just give it a new snapshot containing the array ABC. So we'd have a snapshot starting at ABCD, we would apply a new snapshot of ABC, and then the diffable data source would know how to d delete the elements or move things around if that was necessary. So all the, you know, perform batch updates handling that you may have had to do previously is now automatically handled by the data source diffing itself, which makes uh, your life a lot easier. So that's the general idea of these diffable data sources. Now, uh, as a quick kind of run through of what we have in this application, we have this struct uh, called system icon, and this is going to be the items that we're gonna display in the application. And before I get carried on too far, uh, let's just see what the application actually looks like. So here we can see the application, and uh, there's a few things I can do in it. So I can type and filter different values out. And all of these changes that you see are just reapplying new snapshots and all the animations are just occurring automatically. I'm not explicitly saying to remove particular index paths. I'm simply just applying a new data source set. And this is really nice because it can keep our, really our model layer in sync with what we're displaying on screen. We're really just saying, hey, take our current model and do the work necessary to delete, remove, or move items around depending on where those identifiers lie in the array. So that's essentially what how that works. Now, the, the, the kind of the key way of how this works is that your items need to be uniquely identifiable. So your items have to conform to hashable in order for this to work out. And uh, it could be a very simple thing that's just you know a primitive type that already conforms to Hashable, but if you're making your own types, you just have to make sure that your class or struct, whatever uh, you're using to represent these things, has to be in a Hashable uh, form. So uh, one way that we could do this is, uh, so you can see there's three different properties here. The name is just the image name that I'm using for the system icon. User added is just a bool that I'm using to determine whether a user added this, and in my case, it's just when I hit the plus button, or it was just automatically there from the system. Um, maybe not the greatest sort of uh, data model, but it just keeps my array uh, flat, so it just helps a little bit for this tutorial. Then there is this last property, which is an identifier, and this will generate a unique UUID whenever we create a new system icon. Now, the benefit of this is that we are able to uniquely identify every one of these system icons, right? So looking at this application, if I was to, let's just say I hit the plus button a bunch of times, obviously the mobile me uh, name is not unique, right? There's seven instances just in this custom section or nine instances in this custom section alone. And so if I was to apply a change where I remove just the mobile me name, it doesn't really understand how it could remove that, right? Because it's not unique. So we are using unique identifiers to specify, hey, you know, if I remove identifier, whatever, let's call this A, it knows that it has to remove this particular item. So there has to be some unique way to identify the items that you're showing in the collection view. Then 
there's just a simple method for, for generating a list of these that are uh, based on a bunch of defaults here. But the real crux of the matter for default data sources is all around this state, this, uh, this uh, geez, <laughs> model that is of a hashable type. All right, um, the last little bits are around the NS collection view item. So nothing really special here. We just have a reuse identifier. We have some nib. And then our uh, nib for the window controller is this search field with two buttons and then a collection view. And the one important thing to point out with this collection view, if I right click on it there, is that there's only this referencing outlet from the window controller. Notice that we aren't setting our data source uh, delegate property here. So the, the data source property itself does not need to be assigned because it doesn't need to delegate and ask our, you know, whoever the, the data source would be, these the, the questions that we would normally ask, like how many sections or how many items for this section or uh, configure this cell for this uh, item index path, right? So none of those questions need to be asked. We don't have to implement that data source uh, protocol. We simply are going to inject, and we'll see this in just a bit, the uh, new data source classes that we have on NS collection view. So let's dive into this window controller to see how this really works. So we have this new property that we're going to use, and uh, it's a data source. It is going to be this NS collection view diffable data source. Note that there's uh, two uh, generic types here. One defines the section, and I'm defining the section just using this very simple enum, so uh, just makes my life easy. And uh, yeah, so it just has these two custom and system sections that we're going to use in the application. Then the second one is my item identifier. And these are going to be the uh, items that I'm using to identify the items in the collection view. Now, the reason this is nice is because when we go to generate our collection view, we're now going to know the types of both of these things. So how do we set this up? Well, we're setting up the collection view here with uh, the icon. We have a layout, which we talked about all these new layouts that we can build using compositional layouts in lesson 68. But the crux of this tutorial is on set up, setting up the data source. So the data source setup is going to be like this. We simply create this data source. We pass it the collection view that we want it to basically be driving. So uh, this is really how we're injecting our data source into the collection view, so to speak. We are creating this collect collection view data source with this given collection, and it is going to drive all the changes in this collection view when this data source gets updated. So as long as we have a reference to this data source, we pass the collection view we want it to drive, and we're all set. That's really all the configuration you need to get this going. Now, the, the next part is really just configuring the items for display. So we're given a closure here instead of a, a delegate callback, which gives us our collection view, the index path, and the identifier. So the, uh, the first step is making the item. Pretty simple. We're all pretty used to how this works. We just make our, use our reuse identifier for whatever the item is that we're trying to generate pass the index path that we're given, and now we have a collection view item. Now we're using the identifier, and note the identifier is going to be the item that we defined on this data source. So because we defined the data source to have the item type be system icon, we're expecting that it's going to vend us a system icon. So the system icon is just that struct that we, we talked about earlier, so I can grab the name from that system icon, and I assign the string, and then I just generate the image based on that name as well, and we're good to go. We just return the collection view item when it's all configured. That's all the setup we need to have a fully working collection view at this point. Now, uh, what, how we actually uh, set up all this uh, data is really in the perform query call that I have here. So perform query, the reason that I called it this was just because it's uh, being used to drive the changes that I get from my uh, search field. So there's also a, a little call here for the uh, NS search field for when the control text changes. We generate the new query based on the string that's in the search field as well. So perform query is really just where I'm, I'm doing all the logic to generate these individual data source snapshots. 
So the two main pieces are two uh, new parts here. One is that collection view diffable data source. The second one is this NS diffable data source snapshot. Now the snapshot takes both sort of the same uh, section and item identifier types. And again, they both just have to be hashable. Now here we're just generating basically what the snapshot of our data should look like. So I'm getting the icons and you'll see here, I'm just doing a sort by name. And then I'm just taking the ones that are user added and those are gonna be custom. And the ones that aren't user added are going to be the system icons. So again, you could make a better data source here, but uh, I figured it's simple enough to uh, follow along for a simple tutorial, make it a nice flat array. So here we're just saying, okay, well, do we have uh, custom icons? If we do, then we're gonna add a custom icon section. And again, this type is coming from this definition of what a section is. So because we're passing the section as our generic type, we know that we can use these as our uh, types in the append sections. And so we're gonna append the custom section and you can pass an array of different sections that you want, but in this case, I just wanted one. Then we can append items. So here I'm appending the custom icons that I grabbed here. And we're gonna end up adding that to the custom section. And then the same thing goes for the system icons. We have the system icons and we're gonna add those to the system section. And this is all you have to do to set up your data source. So this data source snapshot is really your data source. This is how the collection view, you know, sees the world at this point. And all you have to do is apply that change to the data source and you can tell it whether you want to animate the differences or not. And that's it. So you're just generating how you view the data in the world. And you, then you just tell the collection view, okay, take this and run with it. So that's really it. And if I go ahead and run this, we can see here we go. And like I said, the search field is just driving this perform query. So as I type, it's just going to filter out any of the items that don't match what I'm typing. And that's it. So there we go. That's the entirety of what you've seen so far from this tutorial. Now let's talk about how these buttons work up here. So the buttons uh, for add item and delete item, and this should actually be delete section, but um, my, my poorly named approach here. But uh, let's look at, there's kind of two different approaches you can take with how you wanna generate your snapshots. And we'll talk about the two different ways. So one of them, is kind of just an approach that always, uh, you know, you funnel it through one pipeline and it's just always gonna regenerate the world. So in the add item approach, we're gonna say, okay, take the system icons, append those, rather append this one to the list of system icons, and then we're gonna run the perform query or really just requery, you know, the, the world for what we have in our current system icons array. So it's pretty simple. We're really just saying update the data source as in the model layer that we're actually holding on to. And then we call perform query and that's going to go through the actual data that we have and generate the new difficult or the new snapshot of the world. We apply that change and the collection view can see that change. Now a different approach is uh, this delete item, which again, I should have called delete section, but ignore that, just think of it as <laughs> delete section. And this is really more of an imperative approach. So what I mean by that is that we're taking the existing snapshot of the data source and we're gonna mutate that and then apply that change rather than the add item approach, which is change the model layer that we have and then just rebuild, right? You change the model layer and rebuild. The imperative approach is take the existing snapshot that we ha already have on the data source. So it's gonna take what the world looks like today. And then based on that, we're going to do different things. So here we're gonna remove all the user added ones. So that's gonna delete the first section. And then we're telling the snapshot to delete sections, right? And then we can apply that difference. So this way is, uh, you know, if you are struggling from a performance standpoint, this is definitely a more performant approach where you don't have to rebuild everything. Um, but there are the downsides of just the fact that you kind of have to keep track of what every, you know, where everything is and how removing this particular item uh, 
reflects the collection view, uh, how it's displayed, right? So the benefit of doing the add item approach is that you just you just change the model layer as you expect it to be changed, and then just tell it to rebuild. And the rebuild call should always be true, no matter you know what what you're passing in there. But the imperative approach is taking the existing snapshot, mutating the data, the the model layer here and then also changing how you expect that to change the data source uh, as the collection view views it. So you're changing the snapshot. And then of course, lastly, we apply the changes at the end. So that's, uh, that's pretty much what, what you see there. So there's adding the items, there's deleting the section, and uh, all is good. So um, yeah, that's pretty much most of what there is to know about the diffable data sources. It's a, it's a pretty simple concept once you've played around with it a bit, but it is a, a great approach. And if you guys have ever dealt with uh, perform batch updates and index paths being out of bounds or moving the wrong ones, deleting the wrong ones, right? This can result in crashes and uh, tons of bad behavior. This is really a great improvement on that approach. Now, I'm just gonna, you can feel free to stop this tutorial if you want at this point. I'm just going to point out a few things that I've hit and uh, some downfalls of sort of the API that we have uh, as it is as I'm recording it today. Um, so one thing I've noticed is that if I actually try to create two sections right off the bat, so if I ignore the fact that this could be empty, this in theory should work fine. There really shouldn't be a problem with this approach. But what I have noticed is that if I try to create two sections as my first snapshot, um, for whatever reason, it really doesn't like this and it'll just totally crash on uh, this outcome. And so the way that I've been able to fix this is basically to apply an initial snapshot and maybe I'm doing something wrong here, but as far as I know, um, this seems to be all fine uh, to me. So one way I, I've seen to fix this at least is to apply basically an initial step and then after that, you can perform the, the second snapshot, so to speak. And I have filed a feedback on this, so if anybody from Apple wants to fix this for me or explain why I'm wrong about uh, my approach here, feel free to let me know. The last thing, which is probably one of the biggest disappointments about um, sort of the, the way this API ended up being released, is that this API, like I alluded to in the beginning of the tutorial, is only available in 10.15.1. Now, not a huge deal because the entire API of diffable data sources were only introduced in 10.15. However, it means that you do have to set your minimum for uh, this to be 10.15.1. Now, there is a flip approach to this where there was an API that came out with 10.15. And the API is, um, and let me actually see if I can find it here. So. Um, so if I look for an diffable data source snapshot, there was a different API that came out, which was this snapshot reference. And uh, the difference between this is actually that it's a class, first of all. So the other one, the individual data source snapshots are a struct type, but the uh, snapshot reference is a class. It also doesn't have any generics tied with it, um, but if you, for some reason, have to target 10.15 exactly, um, you do have to fall back to this because 10, the uh, snapshot API is actually not available to, uh, as we saw in this tutorial, it's not available before 10.15.1. So you could have some approach where you target one or the other, but this could be pretty difficult to do, especially when you have to, uh, basically mucks between whether you have this type of data source or a different type of data source. So if you absolutely have to target um, 10.15 and up, then you should use the data, the diffable data source reference stuff. If you have, to, if you're okay with just targeting 10.15.1, which maybe you're fine with anyway because you're already targeting 10.15, uh, sort of as a you know group then you should probably try to just use the uh, the newer APIs that have the generics and uh, other things. So anyway, that's just a little thing to note for uh, this tutorial. If you have any other questions, feel free to leave your questions in the comments below. All this code will be put up on my GitHub page and I leave all the links for that in the description below. And I will see you guys in next week's tutorial. See you then.